production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm David C. Barnett, the senior arts reporter over at IdeaStream. And uh, today's forum is a conversation with artists participating in the inaugural Front International Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art. Once upon a time, there was an arts leader who came to Cleveland and make the, made the argument that while places like New York or the cultural centers of Europe were all, where all the important art was happening, he was more interested in the arts activities here in the heartland, in the Midwest. No, it was not Fred Bidwell. It was Oscar Wilde. In 1882, he, came on a, he was on a lecture circuit across the United States, and uh, Cleveland was one of his stops. And he, was, uh, he, he, he made a speech on, on aesthetics and what inspires them. And he gave an interview to the Cleveland leader. And one of the things he said was, the, the side your American civil, the side of your American civilization, those of us in Europe who are watching your young republic are most interested in, is not the East, but the West, which was essentially the Midwest back then. So uh, what we want to see what civilization you are making for yourself and by yourselves. He elaborated a little bit on that, extolling the virtues of the Midwest, which he said is without any foolish prejudices that have influenced East America. 130 years later, some of the things that Wilde advocated for will be on display here in Northeast Ohio. Beginning this Saturday, July 14th, the Front Triennial will convene more than 100 artists from around the world to participate in events, installations in downtown Cleveland, Ohio City, University Circle, Glenville, Akron, Oberlin. And we've assembled a group of artists who are participating in front to discuss their art and share their perspectives on the ever-changing and politically urgent conditions of an American city. Joining me on stage are Michelle Grabner, who's artistic director of Front International, the Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art, and an artist in her own right. Uh, Philip Vanderheiden is the artist behind Volatility Smile, an installation at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, of all places. And Jessica Vaughn is the artist behind After Willis, Rubbed, Used, and Moved. That's an installation at the Akron Art Museum. Johnny Coleman, the local uh, sound installation artist, was due to be here today, as many times happens, just before an, a, a debut, uh, there were some technical issues that he has to deal with, so he had to, to beg off of this. But I was, I was talking to, to the artists here, and I'm sure any artist in the room can relate. At the last minute, something goes wrong, and you just have to give it up. Uh, Michelle Grabner, can we have a little bit of exhibition, art exhibition 101? This, the front is a triennial. Well, we've heard of biennials and triennials. What, what does that allow for, it's every three years, I get that. What, what does that allow you to do? Why is it special? Why is it special? Why is the triennial special? Why is its time frame special is the question that you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, Sure. Um, as we know from current events, um, our context, the world that we live in, can change on a dime from morning to evening, from day to day, from week to week. And the idea of three years, taking three years to assess uh, our cultural placement is important. Um, the downside of a triennial is that it's built throughout those three years. And even now, thinking about how we, th how we built um, front and uh, the ideas that I started with and how those ideas have changed over the course of time. 
Um, but now it's my responsibility and it's re responsibility of everybody who will partake in front as a viewer uh, to assess that, to think and to interpret um, those shifting, uh, those, those ideas um, in the context that we're living in. Something that singles this exhibition out is it has a theme, an American city. All of the artists are creating works that explore cities in some way. In some way. Um, why, why that focus? Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, an American city, um, we can think of it as a city, as an abstraction that's important to kind of pull back. So whether that's Cleveland or Chicago, Cleveland and Akron, Cleveland and Paris, um, to think about the city. And the city has always been a place of opportunity, opportunity, um, a cultural opportunity, an economic opportunity, and a political opportunity. So I really see, uh, a, a, I see the city as um, a reflection of humanity, of the best that we can be. As uh, humans come together thinking about civic structures, um, and I really believe that uh, the best human uh, condition exists in a city situation, in a city structure. And you were involved with selecting the artists and asking them to reflect that theme. Yes, yes, yes. And, and, and uh, some of them, uh, and, and most of them, in, in, the, in the way that they should, have entered into the thematic um, very differently, sometimes interpersonally, sometimes critically, um, and that's important to talk about. And I think for, uh, when we get to Phil, Phil can talk about a, a critical relationship to economy right now, um, um, and others more abstractly. Um, yes, so we have a diverse range of interpretations, of understandings. Uh, Phil, your work, Volatility Smile, is set in a very non-traditional gallery space, the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Describe the piece and sure. uh, talk about why that's an appropriate space. Sure, so the piece is, um, it's 24 uh, flat screen televisions, kind of on these little rolling carts, and they go sort of end to end through, they sort of, on a diagonal line through the lobby of our, what used to be the sort of bank teller window lobby of the Federal Reserve Bank, which is now a museum. Um, and on those screens I did um, some sort of computer graphics animations, uh, kind of this, using the same software that you would use to make like Pixar movies, so all kind of 3D modeled things. Some of which are based on the shapes that you would see like in the ceiling patterns of the room itself, right? And so the ceiling of the Fed in that space, if you've been in there, if, uh, I'm sure most of you guys have, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, and it's a, kind of a stunning example of sort of classical architecture, very deliberately uh, designed to make the people that kind of pass through that space feel comfortable and to sort of feel at ease, I suppose, because that's a good bank kind of instills confidence. And, you know, the Federal Reserve in particular is all about a kind of confidence. And so, uh, my animations are more about anxiety, uh, and so um, I thought that that was, that was like a really nice uh, tension uh, between the two things. Uh, so I kind of uh, use, one, one of the things that computer graphics software is really good at is um, making things kind of, you know, uh, unstable forms, things that aren't solid and lasting, and so I thought that would be a really appropriate um, thing to do in a, as a kind of intention with that space. And, and how did the uh, Fed's uh, staff react to your uh, in invasion of their turf? Oh, it was, I think it was good. I mean, I, I think that we really got along. We had a, we had a great time doing it. But, and uh, we actually gave a talk to the, uh, some of the Fed employees, much like in this kind of context here, uh, and uh, had really interesting discussions with some of the economists. Uh, because the video has a lot of, you know, I, you know economists, especially if you're a behavioral economist. You like things like fear and anxiety because there are things that you think about a lot. And so we had a lot to talk about, even though I don't know a lot about economics. Uh, I know a lot about my own anxiety about money. So uh, <laughs> that, was, that was good. Universal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jessica, your home base is New York, but your piece at the Akron Art Museum is a reflection of your Midwest roots in Chicago. Tell us about the, uh, the After Willis series. Sure. So um, the After Willis series is a series of um, grids that utilize the seat inserts from trains that are operating in the in Chicago, a part of the Chicago Transit Authority. So over the over the past several years, I've been collecting seat inserts that are found on the train cars there, and then I install those um, seat inserts on the wall in different grid configurations that are based off the interior of the train cars. 
Um, so through a lot of emailing and cold calling to city institutions in Chicago, um, particularly the CTA, but also IDOT, which is the Illinois Department of Transportation, acronyms being very helpful for this project, <laughs> alongside um, different manufacturers. I collected this material and have been installing them in different locations and sites, um, whether it be a museum or uh, a gallery space. Now explain the title. Uh, it's After Willis. Uh -huh. Talk, talk through the rest of it and explain sure. what it means. Sure. So after Willis is a reference to the uh, superintendent of the Chicago Public Schools in Chicago during the uh, 60s when he refused to desegregate the schools there. So it's a sense of thinking about transportation as a way in which a city has been sort of utilized, segregated, how people move through a space. And so the reference back to that is calling attention to how city infrastructure really sort of calls attention to what resources are restricted or gained access to different um, people um, throughout a city. Um, and then rubbed and moved, rubbed, moved, and used, excuse me, is really sort of um, calling back attention to the materiality of the surface of that, of, of what the seat is, what it does, how it sort of situates the body, how it's been used over time. And, and how do you get, I, I can imagine maybe you sitting on a, on a train uh -huh. going from point A to point B and just sitting and looking at your people across the aisle and thinking, huh, look at that poor person there and that affluent person there. And it's like, are you thinking that or is, is that, was that the inspiration kind of? Um, not necessarily. I, for me, it's really about thinking about the sort of infrastructure of a space. Like how does it like sort of hold people both physically and also through a conceptual framework. And it does that in a lot of different ways. And yes, the city itself holds people of, of different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, class structures, and all of that. It does that without having to really pinpoint in a way that is so direct as naming the body. We see that just through the infrastructure itself. Michelle, this exhibition takes place in several cities. It requires the cooperation of many institutions. Indeed. Had, did you have any issues with that in getting cooperation from all the institutions? No issues. No issues. Not at all. at all. No. Fred had conversations with a lot of uh, institutional representatives ahead of time, um, and really kind of sketching out what can happen, what the scope can be. Um, and uh, when I was brought on board, there was a lot of enthusiasm right off the bat. Now, let's add to that. Um, it, it involves all these different arts institutions. Um, I imagine, and you two could probably reflect on this, um, in New York, would MoMA and Guggenheim work together? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> so what's different about, and uh, you can all, this is going to be a free for all here, I mean, what, why, why is it that, there is, there's just something about the Midwest, that, that it's more open to collaboration? Yeah, I think the Midwest, uh, particularly smaller cities, but you can see this in Chicago as well, here in Cleveland, um, there's a sense that things are a bit more accessible. And I think one of the great things about this triennial is that you'll see um, art at museums, to smaller nonprofits, to college uh, size or mid-sized galleries, which is great, which at the end of the day brings uh, you know, a more eclectic, diverse group of people. It, 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 it flattens sort of the perspective of you know, where you can see work, and that, I think that's a great thing. What about for you, Phil? Um, well, I, I think it's always been easier to um, experiment in a city that is more affordable, you know? I mean, it, at least from a, existentially, right? Like you don't, uh, I know a lot of people in New York that don't take a lot of chances because of the uh, economics of taking chances, right? And if you, um, because there's a lot at stake, uh, you know, in terms of your lifestyle and everything when you do a show. Uh, whereas here, I think, you know, I mean, Michelle and I have done a lot of projects uh, together in the Midwest, um, and they've always been extremely fun and, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a way that, that I think, uh, you know, we were kind of free in a way that uh, we might not have been in a city like New York. Yeah, can I add to that a yeah, little bit? Yeah, please. I, I think something that uh, Front is doing and uh, Cleveland or uh, like size cities, um, what we can see here is identify um, a, a structure to cities that you can't see in New York. And some, some of that, and I'm using New York right now, I mean, if you're living in Beating Manhattan, New York. well, not necessarily. I think I'm, I'm speaking to a reality. Mm -hmm. And I think when you're, when, you're, when you're in Manhattan, 
uh, you do not see the structure necessarily of the city. You, you may see diverse people, but you don't see its civic structures and how it's kind of interwoven, right? And I think in this city, and again, bringing in the public library where Inca Shonabara's work is, uh, the Federal Reserve, the Mather, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. art institutions right. and so, you actually see how it's knitted together and as a result, you understand your role within it. And I think often when you're in large central cities, uh, like, um, um, cultural central cities, it's hard to, what you see first is commerce, right? You see this exchange, right? That comes to the fore. And I think it's not that commerce isn't happening here, but I, I think you see your relationship to all of it, all of its pieces. It's is relationship it, to culture, politics, economics, and you see it from street to street, block to block, from it, east side to west side. Is it because it's, the, 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 those cities are bigger and they're more complex in terms of their bureaucracies? Yes, I think that is, I think that is, uh, one reason, yes, I think structurally they're just bigger, but I also think how we think about power and how power aggregates in those cities and how it manifests, that's the thing we see first, and that's the thing we're supposed to see first. And I think in a city like Cleveland, that is, uh, we, we get something else is pulled back, and I think that's very important. Let's, let's reflect a bit on the point we started out on, the idea that the Midwest, the Great Lakes region, is just as legitimate a place to have a triennial as New York, Paris, or Berlin. I mean, uh, Jessica, Chicago is certainly not an artistic backwater, but it's not a coast. It's not New York or LA. It's not the home of MoMA or Guggenheim. It's not the home of the Yankees or the Lakers. Uh, is there some satisfaction in, repre is, is there some satisfaction in representing the Midwest for you? Definitely, I think that there is, um, there's definitely value, there's definitely um, a place, um, and it's crucial to be able to be a part of all of these different centers and to, ha and to make sure that there's a voice being heard in those places. Um, and I think that given the fact that the, the way in which art is made outside of the coast um, is different or can be different, I think that it's, it's important that that work and those artists are shown. So yeah, I do think it's important. And um, I do think a triennial allows for um, a very specific moment where people can recognize that and register not only the culture that's happening here, but also what the Midwest can offer to other places. One of the things you did, Michelle, was travel around the Great Lakes cities and for you know, looking for your artists. What, 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 what did that yield for you? What it yield is um, kind of looking looking um, at art production in my backyard. Right, I, I live in Milwaukee. Um, Milwaukee is a Great Lake city, um, and spending time um, also with Lisa Kersner um, visiting studios. Um, a lot of studios here in Cleveland, but also Toronto, uh, Buffalo, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, Chicago, Detroit. I'm um, really kind of moving around. Um, what did it yield? Uh, you know, there was something confirming. I, I was speaking to somebody the other day. Uh, a, you know, uh, speaking about uh, the fact that there is no style, one cannot identify an aesthetic uh, cohesion um, from artists practicing in the region, um, but there may be a bit of a truth to the stereotype of um, hard work and dedication. It's a relationship to time and work, um, and uh, that was pretty prevalent um, and rewarding. That's almost exactly what Oscar Wilde said in one of his interviews. He said he was, he was in Chicago, and he said, what I like about Chicago is, is they're strong and young, or something like that. You know, it's, so it's, it's like reflecting that same sort of thing. And it's not, and he, and he was, he was po pointing to the East Coast like it's older, more set in its ways, more used to itself, and it's its own glory and that sort of thing, whereas the, the young kids towards out further west, you know, didn't have that in their heads, at least not yet. Now you guys, you know it's a lot cheaper to be an artist here, just saying. <laughs> right? I mean, and Phil, you had that experience. I mean, you're having that experience now in, in Manhattan, in New York, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, I think one of the reasons that I started making animation was uh, not purely out of the necessity of it, but it's cheaper to make animation than to have a giant studio and make paintings in New York. And, uh, you know, New York is a sort of pressure cooker in a way. And, uh, you know, it kind of really boils you down to who you are. And I think I really wanted to be free in the studio and that was really important. And so to liberate myself from some of those, that the economics was really important. Uh, so that there wasn't, you know, this kind of underlying 
uh, this hamster wheel that I was sort of running on if I were sort of making show after show of paintings in New York or something like that. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, that's not the only reason, but certainly that, that, that freedom makes a big difference, I think. Michelle, in, in dealing with the current issues in American cities, you've also, uh, Front has come up against some controversy. What, most recently, the Asian dope boys with the visa, visa issues they had. Uh, that's been resolved. That's been resolved. Um, but it's, 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 it's par for the course when you're dealing with a, a, I imagine, a thematic exhibition that's dealing with contemporary social issues. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how the visa is related directly to the thematic of the American city. I mean, it, just, it does tell us that our rights to free speech are something that uh, have to be fought for on a daily basis. We can't take them for granted. Um, and that includes also um, within culture as well. We'll talk about, uh, in, in the same regard, talk about the, uh, the Cleveland Public Library installation, which has to deal with a very hot topic right now, immigration. Oh, yeah, yeah, we were talking over the weekend a little bit about Nika Shona Barra's piece, and as you've been hearing me um, uh, say uh, throughout this talk, that um, you know, I really cherish the participation of the civic institutions in the, the arc of front. Um, and that was uh, you know, coming, uh, thinking about uh, bringing Inca Shonavera into the public library made a lot of sense after knowing his British library. Um, but as, we're, um, as we as a nation right now are, are, are thinking about borders um, and immigration, um, that project became very profound. During this, the three months of front, within it, some other Northeast Ohio artists are um, making use of the international spotlight. The Collective Arts Network, or CAN Triennial, will be on display during this month. Uh, and yet another group has organized what they are calling the Can't Triennial, <laughs> billing itself as you can't be rejected from can't. Um, what, what is your relationship? What is Front's relationship with these, with these, with these other groups? We see our friend Michael Gills here representing Can. Um, what, what, um, is, is this like a friendly competition, or how are, how are you feeling about it? Well, I, I, I think it is a competition to some, to, to artists, to arts organizers, and it should be. I stand by the fact that this is a reflection of a very healthy cultural community. When we have pushback, critique, um, alternatives, um, um, you know, all kinds of other offerings. I just think it's, it, rep it represents the richness of this city. Any particular, I, 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 can't, I can't push you to, to <laughs> talk about your children, but are there, are, are there, as we talk about things as you've been going, you, start, you, you started out by saying, I'm, I had one set of expectations going into this. Yes. And they have modified over sure. time. Yes. Um, have have there been there have been delights along that way? Yes, absolutely. And and as things change and shift, we have to understand the source of that shifting, right? Sometimes it comes from a relationship with an artist, mm -hmm. talking to an artist over a period of time, and to see how they're evolving their work. And you know, I'm very grateful to have that opportunity to be able to work with different artists um, and to talk to them about the ideas uh, that are, again, um, modifying, thinking about. Um, fundamentally, I take, on the, I take on the role of a curator because I can then offer artists an opportunity to not only stretch their work by offering them new contexts or give them different resources, bring them to a city and have different relationships with people. That is fundamentally why I do this. Um, you know, and, and uh, um, you know, it's not about me as a curator. It's not about me as authorship. It's not about, you know, uh, the thematic even of American City. It really is at this point about the artists. Um, so when you're talking about the change, the shift over time, um, it comes from these conversations, but it also comes from the world that we're living in. Um, you know, different ideas, different uh, um, 
uh, events in the world will come and inform um, differently um, the priorities uh, that we're all living with. Um, so there's an ethical relationship to how that gets played out in exhibitions like this. And um, artists are always dealing with that ethical relationship of subject. Um, and now again, we're at that point where um, I'm happy to be sitting here and hand off front to all of you. The artists are here, but now it is up to everybody who will view front um, to start bringing ideas and, and interpret the work and have different navigations through the work. Um, um, analyze these ideas, challenge me, challenge the thematic, even challenge the artists. Um, deep looking is required at this point. You describe yourself as a, a sort of a hands off in terms of not imposing, you know, your will or your, your, your ideas on something, but kind of nurturing it along. Whereas some, some exhibitions have a, 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 a very name curator who is, it is a reflection of them. It is, and, and the artists are just their pieces, their pawns to make their thing happen. And so that exists, right? And the artists can attest to that as well. Yeah, I mean, actually having done things with Michelle in the past, uh, I remember this goes back to like maybe 10 years ago or something like that, but I can remember Michelle saying a long time ago, she's like, I want to give the artist the freedom to fail at something and uh, to kind of make the space available so that the space isn't just this sort of venue for absolute success and triumph or something like that, but that it's actually a site for experimentation and possibility and that, um, you know, the in the kind of, um, and that was made available to me a couple of times, and I was always thankful that um, that you know I would Michelle and I would have a conversation about something, and you know we would both kind of think like, well, I wonder how that's going to turn out, you know. And it wasn't this, you know, it, it, and that was always th that was more like the adventure of doing the project versus the sort of like kind of professionalism of doing the project, and that always made me want to you know do more. Uh, because that, that's the way that I like to work. That is uh, Phil Vanderheiden. He's the artist behind Volatility Smile, an installation at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Next to him is Jessica Vaughn. She's the artist behind the After Willis Rubbed, Used, and Moved installation at the Akron Art Museum. And right here is Michelle Grabner, artistic director of the Front Triennial. So we've been jabbering away here for a while, and, and we're going to begin right now the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone out there, uh, City Club members, guests, students, or those who are joining us via our live stream. Uh, if you'd like to tweet a question, please tweet it at, at the City Club, at the City Club. And our staff will try to work it into the program. Holding the microphones today, our Youth Forum Council Chair, Tiolu Orsanya. Did I get that right? You got it? And the other one, Bliss Davis. I, I can handle that. So uh, raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question, and then one of the, uh, one of the folks will come to you. You touched upon it, but could you talk a little bit more about the role international artists are going to have in this? Well, that's that's wide. Um, the role international artists are having in this um, uh, in the exhibition is uh, wide-reaching. Um, there's a lot of artists who are here from different countries. Right now, we're all staying. Many of us are staying at the Madison and Glenville. And it's, um, uh, we, we gather outside, and I can't tell you how many languages are being spoken at any given time. Um, so it's a, it's, the, the international art community is well represented within front. Is there a brochure or a list, or where do you find these events? Right, uh, well, start with the website. The website can be changed and updated on a, on a daily basis, so that's where you'll get all the updates, but there's also a flyer that you can pick up anywhere. I was just at the art store and I saw a stack there. I was at the coffee shop uh, recently, so there's lots of them, and I bet you there's some around here, probably on the way out. Maybe Arlene brought a couple things for us. I would like to remind everybody that we are now known as the North Coast or the Third Coast. <laughs> and I had, I had a question also. Um, 
branding. How many people do you think you're expecting who aren't artists? Who's, who's coming? And um, how does that compare to the kind of people that we get from the Rock Hall uh, when we have the induction here? Do you know? Yeah, you know, my, my, thought, ab uh, my, my thought about an audience uh, that will be, um, that I like to consider an accidental audience, right? Just by the fact that you're driving downtown, you're going to see a Julian Stancic mural that's towering. Um, if you go to the Rock Hall, if you're from the region and you walk into the Rock Hall, you're also going to see a project by John Hershend, an artist from San Francisco. So there's going to be many accidental visitors, um, as well as those who are coming from out of town and those who are, are local who plan to engage in front for the course of uh, the exhibition. Uh, speaking about visitors, um, just curious what the idea was behind having it in three different sort of cities here. And, um, you know, the, uh, sorry, David mentioned what a collaboration between MoMA and Guggenheim might be in New York, but it wouldn't happen. It would be in, you know, there's the Whitney Triennial, for example. And just wondering why, in terms of that, it's just at one institution. I'm just curious as to what the idea was behind having it at Oberlin. Akron Museum of Art, I mean, they're not super close together also, and is, is yeah, there a... Yeah, no, and I can say that, um, you know, being brought in, if Fred didn't have that laid out, already sketched out, that he wanted to work with uh, Oberlin and uh, Akron, that I don't know if I would have understood the region well enough to think about reaching that far to bring these other cities in. Um, since, uh, because we're working with them, they're very different kinds of cities, and I think that also helps with understanding and analyzing the thematic of an American city. So it's not just Cleveland, for instance. It's Akron and it's Oberlin. Um, you know, not only are they different size cities, they have different value structures. Um, and I think that's really important as well. Are you going to be um, doing any measurement of the economic impact that all the international visitors and national visitors are coming to Cleveland? And if so, what are you measuring? Um, yes, we are. Um, and I, I could uh, defer to these people sitting at the table here who have been spending a, a long time working on that. But also, I know it's going to be measured by, for instance, MOCA. They're going to kind of come and understand what it means, um, the individual institutions as well. So I'm not going to be able to give you the, the answer. But afterwards, you can talk to Arlene and Fred. <laughs> That's a question for Michelle. You know, we um, heard there's a lot of trionial, bionial, and um, people sort of have some kind of fatigue. Um, but uh, in Northeast Ohio, it's very new. So actually, the people here are very excited. So um, compared to the peers, uh, like a documenta in Castle, it's really reflecting the arts role in the political scene and compared to others like Whitney, New Orleans. How you describe the authenticity of France compared to the other trial or bio I just mentioned? Yeah, no, Michelle, I think um, it does have to do with where it's located in, in the American interior, right? Um, you know, it's interesting. It does have a relationship with Prospect New Orleans, um, you know, a closer relationship, I think, than all of the other uh, biennials and triennials that, you know, we, we actually know. And um, it's interesting because one of the very first conversations I had with Fred when um, uh, Fred brought me in was that, um, you know, the when we think about prospect, um, you know, it was important that culture, um, you know, establish itself in a city that was, um, you know, recently um, under siege by a natural disaster, and how culture can come in and, and create a focus. And Cleveland is not that. Fred said uh, to me, um, you know, Cleveland is thriving in most cases and in most aspects, and that we should celebrate that, and that it's very rich culturally, and we should put that uh, forward. So that is, um, you know, in, in, it, you know, I do have to say that, and, and we all know, uh, those of us who um, uh, are in this city, is that you know, it's not categorically the ideal model of the utopic city on a hill yet, right? Um, but I think as I've been spending time here. Uh, there is great intention for it to move forward, to understand where it fails, uh, understand its successes. Um, and I hope that this project will put that forward. Um, yes, yes, I think that is not exactly the, the uh, answer, well, that is not exactly the answer to your question, Michelle, but it is uh, uh, sketched around, I sketched around it a little bit. Uh, one of the things that's 
going on, and it was just referred to a, a couple minutes ago, was, was the restoration of the Julian Stanchik um, mural. That is a, a remnant of a program that was in the early 70s when Cleveland was, was down on its luck. And the city fathers determined that maybe with a you know, few thousand dollars worth of paint, we could put murals up on, on the sides of buildings and in, enlighten the place, make the place a little brighter. Uh, I, to my knowledge, only one of them, at least there's one prominent one on 9th Street, the happiness is sitting on a park bench. I think that's the only one that remains, the one that I, that I can remember. But the Stanchek one is, is interesting because um, Julian Stanchek, uh, internationally known op artist and part of the op art movement in the, in the 1960s, and he uh, made one of his creations and, and it was, was up on the wall for many, many years and then one day it was painted over by when, when the building transfer happened. So it, 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 it brings to mind the kind of issue of public art and its, its ephemerality, maybe. You know, it, 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 is, does a mural painted on the side of a building, is that meant to stay forever? Uh, and so what you, what you guys are doing is bringing that, bringing that magnificent work back, and you can see it now. It's, it's getting very close to being finished. And it's, it's just it's inspirational to see that. Yes. No, and I think you bring up another point, David, that's very important, and that is talking about the visual language of that piece. It's an abstraction, mm -hmm. right? Um, it deals with opticality. Um, uh, it deals with composition, order, uh, um, you know, the energies of how those colors come together. And to understand that abstraction was really part of a lexicon, a public lexicon, where the public would understand it as um, uh, be able to translate abstraction into understanding a relationship to order, to the, to the politics of the day, um, and to figure out where we are now. I mean, we understand that a lot of our murals, we see them, and they're very representational, their stories, their narratives. Um, so to see abstraction, and, and I'm sitting here on stage with two artists who also think about abstraction. Um, uh, and that doesn't mean they're not bringing other issues along with it, but to be able to challenge the viewer to not have to just consume, to read, to see something that's representational, but actually challenge the viewer with the language as well. That's really important. And again, um, both Jessica and uh, Phil um, uh, take on that language and stretch it. And Jessica, when you when you lay out your seat covers on the wall, uh, you you say you're reflecting the what what the what the what the bus or the train the looks interior. like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's the starting point, and then from there it's really considering um, the space itself of where it's being installed. Like for example, at Akron at the Akron Museum, mm -hmm. there's a lot of sort of picking and choosing um, with the collection of the inserts that I have. How does this Sit in relationship to the Akron Museum, not as just a site, but also specific to the other works around it. So to your point, Michelle, really thinking about not only the language of um, abstraction, and which is important, and minimalism as well, there's also what does this seat hold? What is this a container for? How are we thinking about the body in a different way? Where the infrastructure itself is a way of saying, hey, the, the body in some respect is already marked before it even, before I even sit on that train, before you know the neighbor next to me does. And so I think trying to figure out those cues and reread the infrastructure, the civic institutions around us in a different way I think positions ourselves as citizens um, in a more you know, direct way, one where we can really think about what we're contributing to society. And Phil, as you were saying, you, you're dealing in, a, in an abstract way with you know, the jittery nature of our, our relationship with finances and economy and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, actually, my background is in abstract painting. Um, and I still kind of think about it in that way. Um, and you know the um, uh, the software that I use, like I was saying before, you know it's it is completely ethereal. Uh, you know, like you, a lot of the animations I'm literally programming in math equations into the into, directly into something, and it's generating a three dimensional form. Um, and so it, I mean, I, and also just as as a kind of meditation on abstraction. I mean, money is a incredibly big abstraction uh, that sort of pervades. <laughs> Our lives, you know, and and uh, I, I actually uh, uh, I, I think a lot about that, you know, uh, but that it's it's like like our 
abstractions as paintings, where they are these things that sort of exist in this kind of other reality, and then they are kind of brought to the world, and they are kind of made concrete and become part of the actual room that one is standing in. And you know that relationship, whether I was making actual oil on canvas paintings or whether I'm making the animations that I'm making now, that was always sort of the interesting part, was sort of like, how does this thing land? Um, and how does the rubber meet the road, as it were, uh, in terms of abstraction? And so I always, I think the Stanzik thing is so incredible because just the idea of that existing and someone actually kind of, kind of temporarily going blind as they drive down the street <laughs> staring at this thing kind of <laughs> gives me a good feeling. I don't know. <laughs> And it's the joy of public art that you're putting, you're not putting a statue of a general out there. It's, it's, it's something that you look at it and you go, wow, you know, you know so it's, it, it does engage you more, probably. Other questions? Hi, when placing um, an art, an artist with um, their work in a, in a location, how, how did you consider who was being placed where? Was there a conversation between the artist and the institution? How did that happen? Yeah, it, it, it's a range, um, you know, uh, I'm going to use the example of Dawood Bey, uh, who has an amazing installation at St. John's Church. And, uh, you know, I think initially he was talking to Fred about having an exhibition at Transformer Station. He sees his work as, you know, photographs to be framed on a wall in a clean white space. And it was a slow conversation to bring him over, to walk him down the street, to consider this space. So when, when I brought him into a, a St. John's Church, you know, immediately he wanted to put the paintings on the wall to the sides of the church instead of suspending him is, is, is what he ended up doing. Um, uh, but it took a while, right? It takes a while for artists to warm up to things and to engage in space. And I think, uh, you know, just talking to him, um, you know, going forward, this is, a, this is a, a way of thinking about how his photography can work in space, that space that Jessica's talking about, that powerful political space um, of bodies and how photography can work in there. That's just amazing to me. So I use that as a, an example to say, you know, I think with every artist, with every piece of work, it was a different conversation. Michael, do you have a question? Uh, I am, uh, here you do that, responsible for the aforementioned uh, regionally focused can triennial um, and not involved in the curation. Uh, I sort of watched that happen, but I look at this exhibit as sort of uh, a voice of the artists of the region and there are 90 of them in it. And so looking across um, the work that was ultimately chosen and, and delivered, uh, I was fascinated to see themes emerge. Um, maybe no surprise that water was a very significant one here on the lake and the river. There are both individual smaller works and multiple uh, major installations that deal with the river and the lake. And Michelle, I'm curious um, if within the theme of the American city, did you see themes emerge in the ways that people dealt with an American city or uh, subjects that they took up or issues, crises? Yeah, you know, uh, the arts artists have been dealing with the subject of the city for in perpetuity, right? Um, you know, to the point where there's many subgenres of how artists take on uh, the city. Um, so yes, I think so. I, I don't know if that was something that I was looking to identify so literally. I was really interested in, in uh, a, a kind of ethos um, around, again, the politics, the space, um, the materiality, and what that can teach us, how we can identify it, how we can ex how we can understand ourselves within that space and our, our responsibility within that space. So your question is a good one, but I, but I have to say that that is not what I was looking for. I didn't come at studios and artists looking for those thematics or genres that would represent those things that we, you know, those structural things that we understand about the city. And in this case, you're right, the water, water would be one of them. Um, yeah. But so, no, I don't, you know, they're there, I know that, but that just wasn't my approach to the exhibition. I think he was, he was also wondering if, if stuff just surprised you. I mean, you suddenly you said, oh, I didn't even think of that. You know, I am, I am dumbfounded every time I step into an artist's studio. Mm -hmm. uh, I have stepped into so many studios over the years. I work with many, many students over many, many decades. 
and I can go to a studio in Buffalo and fall to my knees. There is a configuration with a new space, with new ideas, with new materiality. I, you know, there, there is no redundancy. I, you know, this sounds like a great cliche, but it's so true. I, I, tell, I usually walk away from a studio just shaking my head, like why, this, is, this was totally unknown to me. It really is, it's incredible. Uh, and again, I am very, very grateful and, and um, um, to have, uh, to be able to carry on the responsibility of, of stepping in studios, but always surprised. So these guys are amazing. Another question. So I'd like to address the elephant in the room, and I, I almost mean that literally. I remember, I don't know when this was a glint in Fred Bidwell's eyes, but I do remember standing with him in the sunshine, including with the head of the city club, as artists from Brooklyn melted down a ginormous ice sculpture of the American dream outside of the RNC as this very place elected Ron, Donald Trump to rep, be the Republican candidate. And I've always looked to artists as sort of the harbinger of where is a community going. And this particular American city and this state are, are so central so often in discussions of where is our country going. And since things have so evolved, um, bigger and larger than so many of us anticipated. I'm curious as artists and as your curating of artists, how uh, the, these assignments started some time ago. How have the artists' views of what they're doing in, in this particular exhibition changed over time and how influenced have they been about the politics of our day? Yeah, I mean, I for me, definitely, there's a, a greater sense of urgency with showing this work and really identifying and cultivating the language that is around it and being very particular and making sure that you know my, my voice is heard um, through the work and really um, acknowledging this sort of the sense of bureaucracy that's involved in um, the way in which I create the work or you know I set up these parameters for myself. Um, and, and in a very weird way, uh, just thinking about the seats and how I went about sorry, trying to figure out how to navigate getting a hold of those, it was really about thinking about the network of people that I knew who had some sort of engagement with the city structure of Chicago. Um, and I think that in a very interesting way, I think that's how we're all sort of engaging right now with the politics that we're having to deal with um, given this administration and how we want to really consider moving forward with things. And I think that there's a sense of power and urgency that comes from really sort of understanding and navigating um, the resources around you and making something of that to move forward in a way that really changes what's going on. Yeah, um, I mean, to kind of riff on that a little bit, um, when I first uh, you know, kind of was introduced to the project. Um, the idea of working at the Federal Reserve Bank was really interesting to me because, um, partly because I, I really, um, I, I think that I, I have a lot of respect for the people that work there. And I'm not just sort of glad handing that one. I mean, I, I think that it is actually like the idea of being a, um, a public servant right now, um, you know, uh, is a really important one. And like these people are kind of, you know, I, one of the first days when I was installing this work, I was just talking to some of the employees there, and I said, you know, you guys could all, most of them have like, you know, either master's degrees or PhDs in economics, and they could very easily just take this and go earn a ton of money on Wall Street. And so I asked them, you know, why didn't you? And they kind of looked at me like, God, dude, come on, you know, like, uh, like we're all, and they really meant it, like they're all, they're all, they really believe that what they're doing is, is public service, and I, I do too. Uh, you know, that, and that I think maybe, um, you know, being an artist is a little bit like that sometimes, you know, if you're not going that, going a kind of a certain track of being an artist, like if you're just trying to sort of go your own way, uh, it can feel a little bit like that sometimes where you're just sort of, if you don't believe that you're just making work for yourself, uh, if you do believe that you're making it for somebody else, uh, then, uh, you know, maybe they, I, sort of feel like I, maybe I would share something with the people that work there. Which I think is very politically interesting right now because I think public servants uh, are under attack, I guess, if I were to make a political statement, um, you know. 
So we're on the theme of what the viewer is going to be experiencing as we go through these various exhibitions. And, and using this, the, this, the theme of the city, are some of the exhibits going to express some of the larger themes of the Me Too movement, uh, income, uh, inequality, diversity? Are we going to see um, these different themes that are going on right now politically? Are we going to see this reflected in some of the exhibitions? You will see it quite literally, um, and then you will see it abstractly. So you'll have that whole range. And again, throwing it back to you, um, how do you navigate it? What do you start with? How do you circle back to an exhibition after you've seen another exhibition and you build it? So it's you will have a whole range, a whole navigation of moving through, again, um, ideas that are very specific to ideas that are abstract. So I feel like I've walked into a, uh, the middle of a really cool performance, and I'm trying to get some context. So can you tell me just a little bit about front, and tell me a little bit about the triennial concept and where you've been? Sure. Wow. Yeah. Um, this is where I have to remind myself after uh, working for three years, I understand front very concretely. I know it. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it pulses through my bloodstream, and these very simple questions often befuddle me. Um, so uh, yes, what is front? It's an exhibition, but it's an exhibition that uh, manifests uh, work, projects, installations, film screenings um, in sites throughout Cleveland, Akron, and Oberlin. Um, What's different than a typical exhibition? Uh, exhibitions are usually held within a single structure. So you are going to be obligated to move about. Um, and like I said, uh, at some, you will encounter front even if you choose not to open, wake up in the morning and go to front. I'm sure you will see it if you live in the city in, in some capacity. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the simple answer. It's an exhibition and you can count on uh, 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 Front uh, International 2 in 2000 and what, Fred? Uh, 21, I have to count. 2021. Here's now one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, important aspects of Front to incorporate Cleveland in the European as well as the, well, I shouldn't say European the international art scene. Because really, there's a, you know, a Viennese <clears throat> triennale, there's a, one in Italy, there's one in who knows where. And it is so important to recognize, I think, that there are so many small countries in Europe that can connect with one another, whereas in the, in the United States, sometimes we think of ourselves as totally isolated. And it's so important, to me anyway, to connect with an awful lot of these other artists who are wonderful, exciting, and we never get them here, or rarely get them. Another thing I really think that we need to be so grateful for, and actually I don't know if they're involved in this at all, but think of when the economy went down in Cleveland. Don't you all feel that without the intervention or assistance of the old foundational uh, organizations such as the uh, Cleveland Foundation, the Gund Foundation, these were important, founded by important industrialists who originally came to Cleveland. It is not just can you hold it? <laughs> it is not just all of the current people who are involved. It is the whole history of the city of Cleveland, I think, that's involved in this. And we ought to be so grateful to, because remember when the economy went down, it was organizations like that that started to help so many small organizations and help a lot of small artistic ones. I thought that was just so phenomenal. Doesn't this have any contribution in ways to some of the things that you're doing? I always thought it was like that. Well, <laughs> excuse me. Yes, I can only say yes. <laughs> I agree. Other statements or questions? 
<laughs> Statements are good. Well, I think we did it. Today the City Club, uh, had, we've been enjoying a forum with artists participating in the inaugural Front International Cleveland Triennial for Contemporary Art. We barely scratched the surface though. As, as many things as we reference, there's just going to be so much art in, in and around Northeast Ohio. And it's going to be hard to keep up with. But we gave you a good taste, I think, today. Thanks to uh, Michelle Grabner, Artistic Director of Front International, Phil Vanderheiden, the artist behind Volatility Smile over at the Federal Reserve Bank, and Jessica Vaughn, the artist behind After Willis. So give me the, 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 the parenth parenthetical <laughs> one. Rubbed, used, and moved. <laughs> Dealing with the... Uh, today's forum is the, um, is the Lucille, Lucille D. and Robert Hayes Grease Forum on the Cultural Arts, made possible by a general, generous gift from Sally and Bob Grease and Ellen Grease Cole. We have Sally and Bob with us today. Thank you for your continued support of City Club programming. Community partners today for today's forum include Border Light, Festival of International Theater in Cleveland, and MOCA, the Museum for Contemporary Art. We appreciate your support in promoting today's program. And lastly, we welcome guests at tables hosted by Front International. We thank all of you for being here today. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Ms. Grabner, Mr. Vanderheiden, and Ms. Vaughn. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. <laughs> For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.